<laughs> oh my god, we did it. Uh, we did it. <laughs> we did it, we did it. Yeah, so yeah. I mean I, I, I really do enjoy your uh your podcasts and thank uh, you so much. The um it's it's a very different style from how we do it. Yours are very, very polished and very well <laughs> founded. We we do a one shot wonder. So so that's a warning to you. Right in the middle of recording yeah. the episode with Brett. A message came up on the screen saying uh, your Zoom license is expiring. Meeting will end in five minutes. So oh, whilst, no. whilst Villa was continuing to to interview Brett, um, I had to rapidly find my credit card and resubscribe to uh, to, to Zoom, to Zoom. <laughs> whilst we were recording the episode live. <laughs> okay, Paul, good to go. I'm good to go. Okay, Ayo, good to go. Good to go. All right, so clap coming soon. Welcome to FinTech Daydreaming. The podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of FinTech companies. We bring you real life examples from global and local thought leaders, as well as experts working within the financial industry and seek out the best stories from the front lines of financial services innovation, where dreams of industry pioneers meet reality. Hosted by Paul Krogdahl and Ville Sontu. This is Fintech Daydreaming. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fintech Daydreaming. I am your host today, Ville Sontu, uh, joining you from the beautiful country of India this time. So I do apologize for any uh, bad audio quality or any other issues we, we might see uh, at this point in time because I don't have my recording equipment with me. But I'm sure you will apologize because we're going to have some fantastic content for you uh, for this episode. But of course, I have to bring in uh, my, my beautiful, famous co-host, Paul Grugdahl as well. So how are you today, Paul? I'm even better now that you refer to me as being beautiful. Oh, I mean, you are. That, 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 that really that, that sets it off. I'm almost blushing and, and feeling like a teenager again. So thank you, Villa. I mean, that was beautiful. Thank you very, very much. And I, I must say, with this new job you've got, you've turned in back into an international jet setter, right? You're just yeah, flying yeah. and traveling all over the place. Are we are we not going to have a trend where you record an episode from a new city each time? Yeah, could be, could be. Where in the world is Villa today? So yeah, I've, I've been, I've been, I've been traveling for a couple of weeks now. I still have a few weeks ahead of me, yep. and uh, then hopefully I'll spend some time in the Nordics again. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, being back on the road. Uh, it's, it's good to be back. But hey, uh, enough about us and the, uh, and, and how beautiful you are, my friend. Uh, so let's get to our, our uh, even more beautiful guest who is joining us. <laughs> Uh, for to talk about uh, all interesting fintech topics like open banking. So our guest today is Eyal Sivan, uh, who is the head of open banking at Axway. He's also known as Mr. Open Banking. Uh, he has his own podcast, uh, and I'm sure he's going he's gonna to tell us all about uh, everything he's up to and why he is here today. So welcome, Eyal. Uh, how are you? And uh, please uh, give the audience a bit of an introduction. Sure, Villa. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Villa and Paul, for having me on the show. It's uh, quite a pleasure to be here. I'm usually on the other side of the desk, as you said. Um, by way of introduction, my name is A.L. Savan. I've uh, been in IT for almost 30 years, um, since I was a teenager. And um, most of that time was spent uh, being a software architect. I had a, a startup in the 90s, uh, most of my career was working with a, a large Canadian bank, CIBC, which was a, a wonderful opportunity to learn a lot about banking and large IT systems. And um, then a couple of years ago, I discovered open banking. I fell in love with the whole idea, uh, decided that I, I really needed to dedicate my career to the space, uh, made the difficult decision to leave the bank, um, and ultimately joined uh, Axway as their head of open banking to help sharpen our focus on the open banking space. Xway is a company that's been at the integration challenge for over 20 years. And um, I'm bringing to them what we see as really a unique opportunity that I'm sure most of your listeners are aware of uh, in open banking and how it's radically changing financial services forever. 
Absolutely. And uh, really great to have you. Uh, we've been enjoying your podcast and I hope uh, our listeners are able to find it as well, in addition to, of course, listening to our podcast as usual. Uh, now, we do have a tradition in our podcast, not sure about uh, whether you have anything similar, but uh, we do ask our guests to tell a fintech related joke. Uh, and uh, this uh, the kind of uh, to a little bit let the we have a loose mood in the beginning before we get towards all the heavy hitting stuff. So, uh, so do I dare to ask? Do you have a joke uh, today? <laughs> I, I do. I do. Um, okay. I, you guys asked for a joke, so I, I, I sort of, uh, you know, went looking for a joke. So here's my joke, and hopefully it'll right. set the tone for uh, the reason I started the Mister Open Banking podcast, why I fell in love with the whole idea, and and. The rest of our discussion. So, you ready for my joke? Yes, go for it. <clears throat> so, I got my hands on this new fintech app that was going to aggregate all my financial data and accounts together from lots of different institutions. So, I opened it up and I set up an account and I connected all my different assets and accounts and data from different places using open banking APIs. And I finally got a complete picture of my financial position all in one place. And the great news was the app says that I have enough money that I can basically stop working until I die. As long as I die on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a uh, personal finance planning for you, right? <laughs> I, I like that joke because I think it speaks to the, uh, the balance between um, automation and digital technology on the one hand, but the inescapable human aspect of finance on the other. Yeah, and also some very impressive predictive analytics uh, put in there as well uh, in terms of how long it's going to take. So, so yeah, really a good good way to open the open the episode because we're going to really be talk going into this open banking topic from a completely different angle. Now we've been talking about all the usual things uh, it, during our five seasons so far of, uh, of fintech daydreaming, including open banking, uh, embedded finance, and all of this stuff. But I think we're going to have a bit of a different conversation about the familiar topic today. So. Let's uh, let's get started by uh, kind of asking the obvious question in order to set the scene a little bit uh, for the open banking conversation. And that, of course, is that uh, what is open banking uh, to you uh, to set the framework for for today's discussion? I mean, open banking can be many things, but let's uh, let's hear your perspective into it. it. It's funny how much adding the words to you at the end changes the nature of the question. What, what is open banking is a question about definitions. Um, what is open banking to you is a personal question. Yeah. So really, the, my personal answer uh, is um, really unique. And I think everybody who's involved in open banking has a different way of getting there. And it means different things to them. For me, um, I've always had sort of two sides to the way I look at IT. And IT is something I've been involved in, as I said, for most of my life. Um. There was the livelihood part where you're trying to have an interesting and rewarding career and build amazing things and, and work with amazing people. And then the other part is the larger philosophy of IT and the way technology has the capacity to mold and change society. And how do you shift the balance of those changes to the positive? I'm old enough to have watched the internet grow from literally nothing. I remember the day they added image support to HTML. I was there on my PC, on my uh, IBM PS2, I think, that, uh, you know, writing the code um, to, to put those images in. And uh, it's been amazing to watch the effect the internet has had on society from a very positive one to a negative one, to a positive one again, and maybe sort of negative now, people talking about tech monopolies. So that relationship between technology and society and the larger philosophical questions that it raised uh, has been the other side of my relationship to, to IT. When I discovered open banking, it was like 
these two worlds collided. It was on the one hand, the exact technology that I had spent my career learning and building APIs, bank systems, how do banks talk to each other? These were things I did in my everyday job uh, all day long for years and years. And then on the other hand, you had this incredible shift in how bank systems were expected to relate to each other and to their customers. You had governments standing up and saying, you guys can't be monopolies anymore. You can't be slow. The idea that our methods of ordering taxis are more advanced than our methods for managing our money, that's a little ridiculous. And the way to solve this is through technology. Essentially, a way to create a more fair, just, effective, profitable economic system. The answer lied in these APIs and related technologies. So I, I looked at this and said, wow, this is, this is amazing. Uh, this is an opportunity to combine the livelihood part with the meaning part, the philosophical part. Oftentimes, it's hard to get that from your professional career that a lot of people, they look to hobbies and other things to, to find that sense of meaning. Open banking to me is an opportunity to combine my, my career with a profound sense of meaning and reward. So it means a lot to me. Um, if I take a step back from that, and, and this relates to the philosophical side, I love that open banking is fundamentally a non-zero sum game. Mm -hmm. The idea that everyone wins is very attractive to me. I, I'm very interested in, in non-zero sum systems and complex adaptive systems. And those ideas being brought to bear on the banking system is an incredible opportunity, right? And it's worth noting, I, I say this all the, all the time on the show, but I'll say it here. It's not just one party or the other that wins, like in a zero-sum game or in what you might say traditional banking. The banks win, the customers win, the regulators win. Uh, you know, everybody benefits, and the fintechs win. So, all all four participants in this in this game uh, are winners if it works. So it it really does raise all boats, uh, and that to me makes it. Um, representative of the best of the internet uh, and, and the best of what um, IT has offered us so far. Okay, so let me pick up on, on what, what something you just said there, which is that it's a win-win-win-win opportunity yeah. for all everybody involved. Now, I mean, full disclosure, and of course, our listeners already know that I'm a, I'm a recovering banker myself. So <laughs> I, I just recently left, uh, left uh, uh, my previous employer who happened to be a bank. And... I would describe, at least in some parts of the bank, uh, the uh, uh, the enthusiasm towards opening up and opening up APIs and working with partners uh, as something of a, of a regulatory pressure. Uh, partly, of course, there were many many uh, parts of the bank who realized the opportunity, but the very common things you heard inside a bank is that this is something that we just have to do because regulation, uh, in particular PSD two in uh, in Europe, is making us do this and of course the execution in many parts uh not only in my former bank but also uh, in many banks across the uh, across the european uh, regula uh regulatory area has been uh, well the execution has been matching the enthusiasm so to say so the uh they will do the bare minimum to uh to comply to the regulations this by the way is not my former employee because actually they did way more than that so they did a good job but many banks just did the bare minimum because they didn't really see the opportunity. So if you if you would be talking now to a banker saying that there is no opportunity to to open banking, what would you say that uh, to convince them that uh, this actually is a win opportunity for the bank as well? So a few notes there, and I have to confess I'm stealing some of my guests' answers to <laughs> exactly that question. First of all, this idea that it is the bank's decision 
as to whether they will allow the customer to do this is a fallacy. That's exactly what the heart of PSD2 and other open banking regulations effectively declared. This data is not yours. It belongs to the customer and they have a right to share it with whomever they choose. Yeah. So I think first they have to understand that this isn't really your choice. This is something your customers want and something your customers in many cases have a legal right to. The second thing is customers have been taking your data and sharing it with other people since long before even computing. It's called statements. When they need a loan, when they need to get a mortgage perhaps from another provider, when they need to prove something to their accountant, they take their statements, which is your bank data, and they awkwardly print them out on their printer and then put them in a manila folder and go over to their accountant and say, here's my bank statements. So this idea that, oh my God, uh, why would I you know, allow them to do this? This is just what they're doing now. You're just making their lives easier, okay? You're making it so they don't have to print it out on paper and put it in the manila folder, which you'd, you'd have to be pretty uh, old school to, to defend that level of friction. But really your question is about opportunity and whether you can convince a bank to see the value of data sharing uh, just as a business proposition, never mind what the customer sort of wants. Um, I think that there is extensive evidence at this point that there are massive opportunities from data sharing that have nothing to do with regulatory compliance. And I agree with you completely that the banks that approached this as a compliance exercise and limited their investment to the bare minimum are really missing the boat here. What open banking fundamentally does is tear down your walls built around your distribution channels. Traditional bank thinking says, well, if I want to do business with my customer, I have to do it through one of my channels, either a branch or a call center, or of course, more recently, uh, online banking, mobile banking, and so on, various digital ways. But it has to be branded me, and they have to log in through me, and I get very nervous every time they go to some fintech and, heaven forbid, share credentials or even grant tokenized API access to get the data out of my silo and over to them. That's a little crazy if you understand internet dynamics. The whole point of having a common standard and tearing down those walls is you now have access to this enormous ecosystem that you simply could not get to before. So instead of having your four or five channels that you're desperately trying to make sticky and draw customers into, you now have access to this entire world of digital experiences, the customer just living their life, doing all sorts of interesting stuff. And you now have the ability to just tap into that life and show up in these different situations to offer them loans, to offer them advice, to offer them business. That is a whole blue ocean, as the saying goes, of opportunity that you just had no access to before. It was literally impossible. And I'll provide two examples that I think are really telling. And of course, uh, wrapped up in all this is this notion of embedded finance. I'll, I'll call it what it is. I, I like to say that if open banking is the how, embedded finance is the why. This idea of banking is sort of ephemeral and part of our digital lives. One example that goes way back to actually uh, pre-PSD two days comes from the Open Bank Project was a banking app for the blind. And I love that example because from a business point of view, it doesn't make any sense for any individual bank, even a large bank, to create a specialized channel for the blind. It, it's going to cost you a lot of money. You're not going to have that many customers who are in that situation. And uh, there's no way you could justify it from a business point of view. But if there was a single banking app for the blind all over the world, and this app had the ability to tap into banking data from banks all over the world, 
Well, we're back to this wonderful non-zero sum outcome. You've now helped a whole lot of people who had no access to banking services before. You've helped the banks get access to a completely new demographic that they couldn't service properly before. The government and regulators are happy because they're achieving these social welfare goals that they broadly adapt. And you've created a whole new world of fintech opportunities around this new market. So I think it's a great example of, of the ability to reach distribution channels that were impossible to reach before. Another example comes from the Axway portfolio. There's a bank out of Indonesia that's a customer of ours uh, called Permata Bank. Now, Permata Bank, in the absence of any regulation, released an API to open accounts. If you're familiar with Asia, they're very much ahead in terms of API ecosystems and understanding the API economy. So no surprise, uh, it's not just banks, by the way, it's grocers and utility companies. Everybody publishes APIs. Permata publishes an account open API. They actively market it like a product. They go to FinTech events and they try and get developers to use this account open. A bunch of developers incorporate it into their apps and most of them go nowhere. But one of them is a marriage planning app that lets two people who are engaged plan their wedding, create a kind of gift registry and open an account, a joint account. And everybody who comes to this app who contributes gifts or purchases, all the financial activity, all the deposits go into this account. Now, of course, underneath, that's an API calling Permata Bank that is creating a joint account. Suddenly, COVID hits and the whole country goes into lockdown and this app goes viral. It becomes the way to plan your wedding in Indonesia because you can't meet in person. Mm. Next thing you know, everybody's planning their wedding using this app. These are all calls happening down to Pramata, and they realize an almost 400% year-over-year increase in new accounts. So that's not 10% or 20%. That's 400% increase in new accounts through a channel that had nothing to do with banking. This was a marriage planning app. So that, I think, is a beautiful illustration of how embedded finance works at its best and generates real new opportunities for banks. An awful lot of passion in uh, in your answers there. I, I, it's it's fantastic to to hear all of the passion and your your perspectives. I, you know, as you know, I've spent an awful lot of time as well working with inside of the field of open banking. Um, even worked with Villa's old bank um, for a period of time very early on around open banking. Now, one of the things that you sort of pulled out in in your your answer there, if we unpack it a little bit, is was uh, open banking and then open finance and then also embedded finance there is I, I would say some confusion to a certain degree in the industry uh, by the people that are maybe not as involved in this like like we are where they're, they're starting to get a problem to understand the lines and, and differences between open banking open finance embedded finance and banking as a service sure so and banking as a platform. Even, and banking even as a mystified. platform. And we're not even going to go there because that's my biggest pet peeve at the moment <laughs> is trying to explain to people that banking as a service without a license is banking as a platform, right? Um, but from your perspective, if, if you were to sort of summarize it up to say, how do you distinguish between open banking, open finance, and then banking as a service or banking sure. as a platform? How would you do that? Sure, sure. So uh, uh, like Villa said, there's a lot of confusion out there. So you have to, as a professional in this space, hang your hat on certain definitions. And in such a new area, the definitions vary from region to region, from professional to professional. So I'll do my best to do it the way, you know, I would, I would explain it to a skeptical banker, as, as, as Villa said. So um and again, I'm borrowing from, from some guests, uh, notably Paolo Cerrone, who published a, a wonderful book about th this exact subject and, and how to tease apart some of these definitions. So open banking, um, let's start with that. I subscribe to a definition that I think is different from some of my colleagues. And I, I stand by it. Um, to me, and this shows my technology bias, open banking is all about standardization. 
I know that's not the answer most people go for, mm -hmm. but I think that's what's so exciting is whether you take a regulatory driven approach or a market driven approach, the destination is the same common, open, shared standards for the secure exchange of financial data. That's what open banking is really all about. Oftentimes, it's a mix of regulation and uh, market-driven forces that lead to it. Anybody who's familiar with how this actually happened in the real world knows both of those play a role. Yep. The other element that most people start with when they talk about open banking is consumer directed, consumer permissioned. I own my data, I control my data. That is of course a critical part of open banking. And I in no way want this to be interpreted as I don't support that as an aspect. Mm. But in a way it's almost secondary. You can have the establishment of common open shared standards without initially I'll choose my words carefully, without initially having a mechanism for strong consumer permissioning and, and, and sharing. I do think for open banking to survive and thrive, that has to be a part of it. But the umbrella definition to me is really about the establishment of a new layer of infrastructure, very similar to the way internet protocols are not owned by anybody. They're based on open source, they're shared, they're common. That's the most important part, that we establish this layer of connectivity and interoperability. And then by all means, move to consumer permissioned and SCA and all of that stuff. But what's exciting here is the standards. So open banking is really about creating those common standards. Think internet, think another layer of the internet. Yeah. Open... Uh, I, rather banking as a service, banking as a platform. Those are those are very much wrapped up in this. So I, I think Paolo's definition is great. Uh, it's very simple. It makes sense. Um, to me, banking as a platform is sort of the fintechs, the front end. This is you as a user are interacting with some UX and that UX is doing some stuff for you. Yeah. And if that UX uh, becomes broad enough in its capabilities, leading all the way up to super apps that are bringing in all of these different experiences into a single umbrella app. Well, that's banking as a platform. You're essentially trying to create a single place where I can pull together all my financial data and activity and maybe beyond the financial and manage it and see it and easily uh, conduct my digital life uh, along with the financial part. So that's banking as a, as a platform, the aggregator, the front end, the super app. Banking as a service is sort of the other end of the coin. This is a bank trying to provide a very strong developer experience and very strong APIs that allow developers to take their banking capabilities packaged as API products and embed them into their digital experiences. The banking as a service leaders are going to be the ones who are very strong at that part. They're API driven companies or banks. They provide a uh, a focus on developer as customer and really are trying to spread out into those distribution channels as widely and broadly as possible. A great example of these are BNPL providers all over the world who essentially are providing a loan service that you can embed inside a, a checkout flow, no matter what that checkout flow is, whether you're buying a Peloton bike or you're buying tickets to go on vacation, it, it, doesn't matter, here is a service that just sort of shows up wherever you need. Mm. So that's banking as a, as a service. Embedded finance. So embedded finance is really, I think, just the description of uh, banking as a service being provided inside either a platform, a broad platform, or a point solution. So you might be uh, embedding that service in something that's very specific, for example, buying mm. vacation tickets. The act of calling that service, embedding it inside the, that digital experience, that is what embedded finance is all about. Of course, all those come together because when you have the standards, that creates network effects around your service providers and your, your uh, platform providers. And uh, you get this wonderful dynamic of innovation where your banking data is, is um, able to be free. Hmm. 
Yeah. Shout out to Paolo, by the way, who's been a guest <laughs> on our podcast as well a oh, couple cool. of times, I believe. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. And uh, and uh, so for listeners who haven't uh, listened to those episodes, please go back. I think they were really interesting conversations with Paolo for sure. Yes. Uh, I, I really like the uh, the definitions you put there because, uh, again, we, we've had this discussion with a couple of guests, actually. That what is the difference between embedded <laughs> finance? How do you define embedded finance and open banking and all this stuff? And I think this is one of the uh, more comprehensive uh, definitions that we've, we've heard. Uh, for sure. Now, out of personal curiosity, actually, is something that I've been working on lately, uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the role of an e-money institution in this categorization. So if you yeah. have a banking as a platform for fintech front-end providers, and then you have banking as a service for licensed banks, where would you put e-money institutions that provide these open banking-like services as well? Uh, would, would that be a platform or a banking as a service? What do you think? Yeah, it's, it, that, that's a great question, right? Um, e-money and not just the niche e-money providers, but you get into CBDCs and various national scale digital wallet initiatives. Uh, even the European Union has uh, the, their own e-money initiative and it's they're trying to align it, it seems, with PSD3. Um, where do you put them? I, I don't think it's unique to e-money providers. I think there's a few intermediary players, like aggregators are another example, mm -hmm. where they are participating in the ecosystem and providing certain critical aggregation mechanisms, whether that's e-money doing it on the payment side or aggregators doing it on the read data side. And you have to start to recognize those roles. So I think we're still teasing out exactly what those intermediary roles are. I don't think they fall cleanly into one side or the other. If you look at FDX, which is emerging rapidly as the North American standard, they have a role defined for an intermediary. This is unique uh, to them compared to the European standards or uh, CDR has something similar, but none of the PSD2 standards, uh, nor the UK standard, have an explicit definition of an intermediary role. So you may see that happening in PSD3. Um, as to where would they fall sort of service platform, I think uh, it's a function of your business model more than anything. So if you're an e-money provider and what you're doing is providing a front end and saying, I've created mechanisms that allow my e-money to be used in lots of different experiences somehow, well, you're probably more of a platform. Yeah. If you're really trying to provide some sort of embeddable checkout mechanism or, or something like that, uh, you're probably more of a service. Yeah, I'd love to go to the direction of uh, continuing the discussion about mobile money and emerging markets as well. But yeah. uh, let's put that aside for a moment and uh, actually to pick up another topic you mentioned, which is the uh, the differences between uh, between specifically the US or North American market in open banking and Europe. We talked a lot about already about PSD2 <clears throat> and the way the bank banks have been implementing uh, open APIs uh, here in Europe based on the PSD2 requirements and then beyond in many cases. Uh, but what about US? I mean, how, how has the development been in the in North American markets? I believe it's a little bit different, uh, not as much uh, regulation driven, at least. Yep, not at all to date, other than a few signals from the White House. But <laughs> that is expected to change uh, over the next year or two. Um, the Let's start with that, that the voices from the White House have been getting louder. You've seen the statements coming from uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau getting more uh, aggressive in terms of data portability. They're going to be looking at Dodd-Frank. I think it's section 1033 that talks about consumer rights to data portability. So this sleepy section of Dodd-Frank in light of open banking is now getting a lot of attention. There's uh, bigger fish to fry, shall we say, in the world right now for the US, but uh, I think you're going to see continued activity uh, in that direction from the regulator. Expect, in my opinion, to see regulation coming out of the U.S. in the next 18 to 24 months. Um, <clears throat> plug for the show. The next episode uh, is uh, going to be all about open banking in the U.S. Uh, my, my guest is Jane Barrett from MX, uh, who's wonderful. And she talks 
about exactly this. So uh, another disclaimer, I'm going to be stealing her answers. Sorry, Jane. Um, I think uh, this painting of the U.S. as an open banking laggard is somewhat overblown. Right. Certainly by the definition that stresses regulatory progress, they are behind. If that's your measuring stick, yes, there's no question. Other regions have regulated open banking. That, that's a fact. Um, there are laws. Uh, in the U.S., there is no such law. There isn't even the level of activity that you see in Canada, who is late to, by the way, my native, uh, shout out to all the Canadians out there. Um, what you see in Canada is, is a declaration from the government and screen scraping, the establishment of a committee and a czar, and they're having meetings and so on. So regulatory progress in Canada, still no timeline, still no uh, penalties or anything like that, mm. but progress. In the U.S., you haven't even seen that. You've just seen a few statements from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau broadly about portability. Despite the lack of any serious regulatory moves, FDX, the standard that's really emerged as the de facto open banking standard in the U.S., continues to show strong linear growth. They now share 32 million customer records, which is more than most open banking standards all around the world, mm. including the regulated ones. They have signed up every major bank, every major aggregator, tons and tons of fintechs, big ones, small ones, and they've all collaborated on the development of an open source based standard. And it works. They are showing a level of cooperation and utility that, frankly, the regulated regions should take note of. Jane talks about regulatory constraints and the advantages of not having regulatory constraints. And a lot of that comes down to innovation. In other words, you can move towards where the market needs you when you're not trying to comply with a certain regulation that says, open up current accounts or payment accounts but not these others, you know, wait until the next round of regulation. That puts banks on a very defensive posture right away. To your point, Villa, that they're, they're thinking, oh my gosh, what's next? First, we have to do this uh, current account and now they're going to come to us and make us do payments and they're going to make us do... And, and it creates this very sort of negative dynamic. Mm. Whereas in the US, if they see an opportunity in rewards, well, FDX will set up a working group to figure out a standard to do rewards. If they see an opportunity in treasury, well, they'll set up a standard to talk about treasury or small business or whatever the market seems to require uh, in order to drive adoption of that standard. It's notable that the biggest absentees from FDX are the GAFAs, uh, right? The, the, the big mm -hmm. technology companies in the U.S., and I think that that's definitely creating a certain pressure that is uniquely American over there as well, that they realize, oh, my gosh, if we don't do something and establish some rules and standards around this, uh, we are basically just going to have Apple Bank and Google Bank and Amazon Bank. Uh, they'll find a way to provide these services. They already are. So I think that's creating a kind of healthy tension. Uh, banks are starting in the U.S. to see open banking as something of a moat around their existing market position, which is great. That's how they should see it. And um, moreover, they're becoming very positive. If you speak to American bankers, their tone around open banking is now very uh, enthusiastic. They see the benefits of data sharing. The aggregators all now support FDX. So every major aggregator, including Plaid, now supports FDX as a backend standard. So you're seeing all the right movement in the US um, in the absence of any regulatory regime. As I said, I think regulation is coming, uh, but I think regulated regions could learn a lot from the US in terms of the uh, innovation and utility that they're bringing to their standard, um, specifically in the sense of following market opportunities. Um, Jane on the in the interview, you know, sneak, sneak preview, it's not out yet. Uh, she, she says, imagine if in the US, there had been a regulation that said, well, open up your 
current accounts, like checking accounts, as they would call them in the U.S. How much innovation would that really lead to? Right? It, it's it's like, well, okay, you could do some some kind of PFM apps and maybe some loan adjudication, but you're missing out on all of this other stuff that you could be doing because you're focused on this very narrow scope that the regulator, that the regulator has defined. So I, I think um, for every region, finding that interplay between market-driven and regulatory-driven uh, is not only critical, but unique to every region. Yeah, I think that's, I, that's I want... spot on. So, so I think the joke goes that in Europe, they like, like, like to regulate things into existence and that rarely <laughs> works. <laughs> so, so I think there's some kind of balance there is, uh, is needed for sure. So uh, Paul, you were saying. You know, I was just going to say, I, I ponder whether there isn't another dimension to this as well, um, as well as the regulated or market driven. There's also a difference between banks that have engaged in this as an IT project uh, versus banks that have engaged into this more as a business-driven opportunity. And I think we're also seeing yeah. that in regions where it has been driven by regulations, it's being engaged more as an IT project, whereas in regions such as in the US, it's being seen as a business opportunity and there are business drivers behind it, um, therefore creating a very different dynamic and a look on how we drive revenue and profit and market this outwards. Yeah, very right. much agree. Yeah. Yep. Now, uh, looking at the time here, let's uh, start to round things up, but we cannot really round it up before we talk a little bit about what's next. Uh, so we've kind of established now that uh, how we got here where we are today with open banking. It's partly regulation, it's partly market driven. We did, I think we did a good job uh, on the definitions of what different terminology means and even talked about the uh, regional differences and the, uh, the favorite use cases. I, I love the ones that you brought up uh, there in the beginning. But now, having said all this, we touched on a few things. We, we mentioned things like PSD3 maybe coming soon in, uh, in Europe. And that leads us into this uh, question that what's next for open banking? What, what is, uh, I mean, is it gonna be PSD3 that's gonna open up everything? Are we gonna see this fantastic future of everything being open? Is it gonna be the Open Finance Act in, in Europe? Or are we gonna see some kind of market-driven development? And uh, to kind of sum it up, uh, what would you do differently in this next generation of open banking in order to make this uh, real open uh, banking future uh, a possibility? So kind of, a all, all over the place question, but again, <laughs> turning the t turning the page, uh, what would you do differently? What do we need to do to, to get to the next level in open banking? And, and uh, when do you see this happening? Yeah. So so let me take them in reverse order. The, the PSD3 question, then we'll sort of zoom out and talk about open finance, open data. Um, on the PSD3 front, it's, it's very interesting to watch. It's a particular region. Yes, the birthplace of open banking in the form of PSD2, but with some expected missteps being the first relative to other approaches to open banking. So I think that that's been broadly recognized that the PSD2 could have done things better uh, in a lot of cases. And I think Europe having seen what the UK did, having seen what Australia did, and then Brazil, and now they, the US and Canada, they're looking in the mirror and going, oh, well, yeah, some of that stuff would have been a really good idea. Um, and, and they're recognizing those gaps. It's nice to see the dialogue between the European Commission and the uh, the European Banking Authority, I think, right, the EBA. Um, I, if I recall the, the timeline, it was... Um, end of last year, like October of last year, that they published, uh, the EC said, yeah, we, we've we got some problems with PSD2, and they published like a call for advice or something to the EBA, and then the EBA responded. I thought with, I, I think what is in some circles, you know, like our nerdy circles is called the, the opinion. Um, so the EBA uh, publishes the opinion, which was sort of their list of, uh, hey, uh, commission, this is the stuff you should be doing. And I think they did a pretty good job of, of describing some of the areas um, that the PSD2 is sort of lacking. Um, you can break it up in a, in a couple of different ways. They talk about structural improvements. We've already 
mentioned one of them, and that's this uh, explicit role for an intermediary, whether it's an aggregator or somebody doing payment initiation in the middle of a chain. They talk about you have to start defining some of these e-money providers, as you said, Villa and, and others. So, so that's part of it, and I agree. Um, they talk about things like liability and liquidity and even how those things get wrapped up in technical issues like strong customer authentication. It, you have to be able to technically trace the movement of data if you're going to come up with a liability model that spreads that risk and, and holds parties accountable. So it's great that they're looking at that question of liability um, and, and liquidity, which are different but related. The technical side, which is my bias, that's what I do for Axway all day, that's my, my, my career, I love that they loudly called for a common API. Finally, right, I think that was the big miss in PSD2 was they sort of let every region go off and do their own or join a consortium of their own. And they came out very different. So you have Berlin Group and then uh, so STET, uh, Polish API, things showing up in different regions. Even the, the, the new next gen API from Berlin Group is quite different from the old one before. So there wasn't enough prescriptive discipline, in my opinion, around the actual APIs compared to the UK, who was much more prescriptive um, and frankly demonstrated a much better result with the ability to measure uh, the behavior of the ecosystem. So I think loudly declaring you need a common API for the EU is great news. That's going to take some work, but you will be better for it in the end. Very much related, a dedicated interface for third-party providers. So they talked in their opinion about you can't just take your mobile banking and say, this is now how, what the TPP gets because I want to do the least amount of work and, and get to compliance. That is no longer acceptable. You have to have some sort of dedicated interface for developers to be able to interact with your bank and in a, in a genuine way, the way you would treat other customers. I thought that was also a, a great statement and needs to be done. Uh, to your point, Villa, alignment with digital wallets and e-money, they talk about that. Uh, alignment with the, uh, the EM, I'm going to get the name wrong, EMA or something. There, there's a monetary uh, policy being put in place in Europe as well. So they're, they're trying to get those two aligned, which I think is great. Uh, so lots of uh, great progress, well, progress, great commentary uh, on where PSD3 has to go, right? Some of the gaps that it has to fill in. I think there's still some missing pieces and those pieces are tricky. So no surprise that that they're not there yet. Um, they don't talk as much as I would have liked about alignment with digital ID. Uh, to me, there are three major pillars that have to come together in order to build this open banking infrastructure. One is open banking, which is to say the standardized APIs and related security mechanisms for capturing consent. The other is payments and the whole story that goes with payments and instant payments and, and uh, e-money initiatives and mobile money initiatives and, and how essentially you pay for things uh, in a given environment and a given region. And then the third is digital ID. The key is bringing these three pillars together. So I, I would have loved to see them talk a little more in the opinion about digital ID and how it was going to get wrapped up in this PSD3 uh, improvement. The oh, other, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the other one was um, reciprocity. This is starting to come up in the US and in Canada. To what extent should the standard explicitly talk about reciprocity? This is a fun dinner conversation with open banking people because I don't think anybody is really saying realistically, I don't think anybody but banks are saying realistically that, uh, hey, if I share my money with, a, um, excuse me, my data with a FinTech, uh, they have to share their data with me. Um, that is not a tenable position and, and sort of goes against the principle of the customer gets to decide. Yeah. But in the interest of creating something that generates this uh, non-zero sum benefit, would it be okay for you to regulate a prompt to the customer to say, hey, you've shared your data in one direction. Did you know it was possible to share your data in the other direction? Perhaps you'd like to consent to do that as well. Um, 
Perhaps I could incentivize you to do that in some way. I think it's important to build mechanisms into the standards that allow banks to sincerely offer valuable things to the customer as part of a one-way uh, consent flow to, to incentivize them to, to go the other way. It has to be in the customer's control. Um, but I think the, the corollary to that is that, yes, I, 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 for one, believe that TPPs should face some degree of obligation to share their data as well, right? To, to sort of say this is a one-sided coin and banks, you know, there's this role of banks that have to share their data and then there's this role of TPPs that's going to receive the data. Uh, TPPs have lots of valuable data too. I don't see why they're sort of exempt. And if you look at Brazil, it's really interesting. They sort of solve that problem in a very simple way. The TPPs are also banks, <laughs> so they're automatically regulated. Now, of course, this leaves a gaping hole in their ecosystem because if you're just a TPP, you're just a fintech, you can't get that paper that's going to let you consume data. So this is hampering their their uh, growth. But at least they're saying, hey, if you're a data consumer, you have to be a regulated entity and you have to be able to have the capability to provide data. Um, so I'd love to see some reciprocity stuff too. And then finally, an easy one, but it'll take years, is uh, uh, cross-standard interoperability and international uh, interoperability. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I mean... Last last episode we had a we had a saying we had a kind of thing in the end where we decided that we've just opened up so many topics that we we need to kind of do, do an episode on each one of them. Now yeah. I feel like we have a two in the row. So you know, just based on the things you just listed there about the future of open banking, I feel that we need need to have an, at least five episodes about all the things <laughs> I mentioned, mentioned there. Oh, it's a uh, it's a really really uh, interesting. I'll, I'll guest strategy. host with you guys. Bring me on. We'll, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's do a collaboration. Uh, we, we did we did discuss the whole option of for certain episodes where where we do bloom out like this uh with so many other additional things uh you know possibly doing an an ad hoc linkedin live session on the back of the podcast episode so maybe it yeah, becomes sure. a, a new trend for us when we have fantastic guests like you join us with uh, so much fantastic information and and points of view Absolutely. I mean, that, that's uh, let's let's absolutely uh, take that to the uh, to the next level. I think we can, we absolutely can do that. So uh, just to kind of round up, I think we we kind of did, actually did a good job uh, in terms of kind of having from from the start of defining open banking to all the way to the future uh, and the things that uh, are, are going into the right direction and some things that might not be working out currently. And we also established that we have a lot to talk about uh, in the future as well. So uh, again, uh, I think it was a thank you again for a, for a great conversation. And uh, time really goes fast when you're having fun, like we say on the show. So uh, AL, I mean, we always like to give a chance in the end uh, to basically, well, continue plugging on your podcast, I suppose. But how, how uh, will the listeners be able to get in touch with you? And what else uh, would you like to tell about yourself and, uh, and the things you're doing? Sure. Uh, thanks, Villa. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm very, very active on LinkedIn, but really my primary uh, sort of source of publication is the podcast. So listen to Mr. Open Banking. Uh, we're in the middle of season three. We've got uh, now, what, 40,000 regular listeners, which blows my mind from, from all over the world. Um, give it a listen. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And if you're interested in what I'm doing on the software side, uh, check out Axway. Uh, we've recently created a pretty amazing open banking solution, which we piloted in Brazil and have now brought to North America and really want to bring to the to the whole world to help accelerate this whole revolution. Uh, so find me, ask me things. Uh, this, this passion uh, extends beyond uh, a single interview, I assure you. All right. And thank you again for being a fantastic guest. Another long episode for us, I think, is where we're almost hitting the record here, uh, which is always a good, a good sign because there's a lot of things to cover. But great. Uh, again, thank you. And thank you to our listeners uh, for sticking with us for another episode. Now, do remember the usual things. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and especially please comment on the, especially on the videos and, and give us a, a review on the podcast platforms. This helps out tremendously. Uh, and of course, as usual, tell your friends this is all this fun, fun, uh, fun discussions we're having with our great guests here. 
And with that being said, we will be back in two weeks with another episode. But until then, this has been Fintech Daydreaming. This is Fintech Daydreaming. <laughs>